So, um, I've got Billfield here on Skype uh, from Australia, and his big hit that's on our top 30 is called Frequency. Tell us, where does that song come from, and what is it all about? <laughs> where does it come from? Well, that's a kind of a challenging question. Um, I suppose for me, even though everyone hears it uh, probably really different than me, um, it comes from a big gospel tradition. Um, I was born in Miami. Um, and it was one of the first pop songs that I wrote uh, when I started uh, with it, with my uh, deal with Sony. And uh, for me, it was kind of like this kind of funk way of putting gospel into funk music and having it be dancey. So I kind of mixed a couple of genres together and you ended up with Frequency, which is kind of an unusual song, I think. But it's super fun. And I knew right away that it was something really different that I'd never heard before. So Well, from the opening notes, it just grabs you and drags you along. Um, and, of course, your vocal range. I mean, those, those high-pitched uh, notes you get out there are just absolutely amazing. They're, they're pretty crazy. Actually, I had um, a, an engineer at the time who I was, I was messing around with the high notes during the session. And then... He was basically like, oh, you have to put that down. You have to record that. So that's kind of how I ended up actually getting them on. So it wasn't really meant to be, um, but it ended up being kind of such a cool little thing that we couldn't resist. So well, the like world got to hear me sing. It's like you're channeling Mariah in the early days. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to, you, do, you know, um, do you know the magic flute, like uh, Mozart? and all of that. Um, I actually, when I was a little kid, I used to um, imitate the Queen of the Night all the time when my voice was very high, and I would do that. And I still can actually sing those notes. I don't really do it because it's so obnoxious. <laughs> but when, you know, when I was little, I really loved it. And I was, and I was in um, that opera when I you know, cast as one of the little kids in Miami. And uh, so that's kind of how I started fussing with that range, and it just kind of carried on. So Frequency is doing really well on our top 30, and uh, now you've just released uh, Blow My Mind, which is also a really great song, and I'm sure that's going to do well here. Uh, that's quite different, though, uh, a little bit of a different energy, but still the same feel. Uh, tell us about that song, please. Um, well, I guess Blow My Mind is, uh, it was obviously supposed to be kind of 80s inspired, like like freestyle, sort of. Um, it. I kind of actually got the idea because I was hungover one morning and I woke up and I saw someone just riding down um, the street in roller skates and for some reason the whole verse just came in through my head and I was on the way to the studio and suddenly this whole verse just like, and I started just writing all these lyrics down and the second that I got there I was like, okay, I don't know what this is, but this is definitely 80s, you know, someone's on roller skates, like, so I kind of just put it all together and you ended up with Blow My Mind. So it's a little bit of like a hodgepodge of a real life situation. Yeah. And uh, the reception of the songs, uh, your music, um, how's it been uh, worldwide or is it just in Australia? How's the reception? No, it's been worldwide. Um, you know, I have listeners in London, Manhattan, uh, you know, like obviously here in Australia. Um, but uh, I guess I've been getting a lot of people in um, in Indonesia for that really like the video to blow my mind, which has been interesting. Um, and people just every day they discover it in all sorts of different ways, like a different song. You know, I had uh, someone just yesterday, you know, writing me about how they found blow my mind, you know, on Spotify, and I was like, hey, you know, how did you come across it? And you know, they um, they basically told me that they listened to a lot of Kylie Minogue, so apparently Spotify that song, they put it with Kylie, so. You just never really know how people are going to find the song or how a song's going to be listed or how it's going to be viewed by people. So that's it's been kind of exciting, you know, seeing how that happens. Fantastic. This is uh, Bill Field uh, on our Top 30. On Tuesday, you can hear the whole interview here on Gay SA Radio, where you are family. Cool. That's the first part. Um, cool. Okay, so this would go out in my breakfast show on Tuesday morning. So I want to start this interview with Bealfield this morning here and ask why did you change your name to only Bealfield? I mean, it's like Madonna or Rihanna. Now we have Bealfield. What's with uh, that? That, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel so like, 
pretentious, but that's not like it at all. Well, I well I was Kyle Bielfield before, and that was my my stage name. And kind of when I came over here, I'd done so much opera, and I actually had an art song album of American art songs um, that was under Kyle Bielfield that you can listen to on Spotify. Um, and uh, it's uh, it actually did really well. It got a lot of really amazing reception, but it was very academic. So to do this, I really wanted to do music that was really fun. And it was kind of really like the purpose of it was for the complete opposite of what the purpose of stopping by was in a certain way, you know. So I figured that for me to put it under Kyle Bielfield and to kind of force all the people who liked my classical music to, to come over, you know, without, without being given an opportunity was a little unfair, you know. So I, I decided... You, there's actually this woman here named Marsha Hines. I don't know if you know who she is. She's a really famous um, singer um, from the 70s and 80s. And when I first came here, she... And she's actually really famous. She's doing a big show uh, worldwide um, called Velvet. And she had actually come when I was in the studio originally and told me that I had to forget everything I ever knew to do all my vocals and that everything I learned from opera suddenly now means nothing and I had to kind of start over to do, you know, X, Y, Z. You know, of course, not technically technically wise, you know, but as far as the actual sounds, I needed to really make them more uh, complex and different and have a different sort of variety than what I usually had relied on. And so she kind of thought that Beale Field was the right thing. And it was one of the options. It's either going to be like KRB, like Kirby, you know, which would be Kirby, I guess, shortened or KB, or I didn't know what it was. We were just Kyle, which I thought was a little obnoxious. And so we ended up with Beale Field, this thing that's super unique, you know, there's there's really not any Beale Fields around, so why not, right? Oh, that's a cool name, I mean, really. But why Australia? I mean, of all the places you could go to, why there? Because I like koalas. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I... <laughs> I originally came here with a buddy of mine, and I just, you know, I did some stuff with Sony. They really wanted me to do an album deal, and I guess at first I didn't know that it would end up being something much bigger than than what it has become now. Um, originally, I just thought I was going to come and do a, you know, a nice album, maybe something jazzy or or something a little different. Um, and I ended up just writing some pop music that we all really. That every you know everyone at Sony was just jamming out to it with like oh this is it we have to release this so that's kind of how it happened I just wrote some songs that people seemed to like so going down a totally different path than what anyone thought. But I'm looking back talking about the path. I mean um, we found a video on on YouTube of you as a twelve year old perhaps little chubby cheek boy oh. doing gospel uh, singing uh, in the temple there. <laughs> How did that come about? Oh no! <laughs> it's in there. my father's house. In my in father's my... house. That's the one. Okay, so how do I tell this story? <laughs> this is really bad. Um, well, actually, it's funny you bring it up. You know, when I was a freshman in college, um, the kids actually had uh, created a drinking game over the summer before I came because they had read my name on a roster and looked me up and they all started a big massive drinking game during the thing where every time like Mary shows up or something you take a shot. I mean <laughs> super like super crazy college kids. <laughs> so it's it's kind of followed me around for a little while, which I don't mind, you know. It's um I was a kid and and a woman in Miami had asked me to do a concert for her. She was a big she wrote uh, plays and musical things and so I went and did this thing, and her donors heard my voice at that age and told her, hey, we'll pay for an album, we'll pay for this kid to do something, we really want uh, you to do something with him. So we started off, it was originally just going to be a little demo thing, just to kind of see, and you know, one thing leads to another, and I ended up being Jesus, and so now, you know, now I'm Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's how that goes. But it actually, it led, this year, it won a, an award in the International Christian Film Festival. It's, it's already, what, I mean, how many years old is it? Like 15 years old, maybe more? So, you know, it's it's still doing things, which is kind of crazy. But I guess, you know, if people like it and it inspires, right? That's what I'm doing, is I'm trying to inspire people, so. Did you always sing? Or when, did you, when did you realize you had this talent and that you could do something with it? 
level when I was uh, two, I, I actually have videos of me singing it too really high, but I guess the first time that it kind of became a thing was I was about four. My father, um, you know, went with me for Christmas Eve to a, to a Christmas Eve service at my church and he heard me singing and he just like looked down and he was like, is this Michael Jackson sitting next to me? And so he had this thing because he said he, he didn't sing vibrato when he was younger in the boy choir that he didn't have it. He always felt like that was the reason why he was never able to pursue his singing dreams or something. So he basically like like a year or more with me, just like trying to, to explain to me what vibrato is, even though he didn't really know. And children aren't really supposed to have vibrato. So it's a little, that was a little bit of a manufactured thing, but he basically helped me kind of nurture my voice into something um, that people would enjoy, I guess. And then Juilliard, how did that come about? I mean, that is such a prestigious place to go to, and the uh, majority of people who go there never actually finish. You've got a master's from there. I mean, that's, that's really something. Yeah, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, like hands down. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Which is pretty amazing, you know, when you when you really put your mind to it. And, and I thought, sorry for derailing just for a second, but when I first got in that first week, I really thought that I might not be able to do it. And about the second or third week, I had teachers trying to, to get me cut from the program and trying to do different things because they really did. I was too happy, apparently, and I, I was smiling too much in class and and that was somehow bothering the kids, but I mean, it wasn't, but you know, they're very old fashioned in their teaching approach. And I really wasn't from anything like that in my background. Um, Cause I had gone to NYU for my undergrad. So it was very, very liberal, very, you know, futuristic kind of educational system. And, and I guess um, about the, the third week, you know, I just thought to myself, if I can do this, I can do anything and I want to do it. And it's something that's worth it. And so I just, did it and just it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life truly and just every night 12 hours every day a week 12 hours a day sleeping under pianos some nights I mean truly like you had to be there all day long singing every day sometimes you wake up and your voice is destroyed and you have to sing in front of people at Lincoln Center and this and that and you wake up and you know it's like you have a massive showcase every day but you can't sing because you're so physically exhausted. So it really kind of gets you to a point where you learn how to do things that you never thought you could. So it was worth it. So you've, you've sung in some quite uh, beautiful halls and uh, concert areas. Which place that you've uh, been in has got the best acoustic? Oh, it would have to be Alice Tully Hall, for sure. Um, that's right there at Lincoln Center. Um, it's it's a hall that was actually built out of a single tree. So they actually took one tree and fashioned all of the, the wooden paneling all around. So when you're sitting in the hall, you're actually inside of a single tree, which wow. to me, performing there felt so cool that I was singing to people inside of a tree. I was just so fascinated by it. And of course, the acoustics are magnificent because it's all even so what what you're hearing um totally is the same throughout the hall and it doesn't switch so it's pretty it's pretty spectacular it's some place that everyone should go to when they go to manhattan it's awesome so alice telly hall telly hall that sounds really great um and we want to get a little bit personal before we go into the pop career um now you're a very handsome man and uh, openly gay man your coming out story how was that if you don't mind sharing with us uh, look, I, I just didn't think it was that big of a deal. I mean, everyone else around me thought it was such a big deal. You know, it's, and it's still fascinating me to this day, because I just, my whole way in life is, is like, I just, I think, I feel like we've progressed so much into this century. And... I feel like even what's happened in the last 15 years is so remarkable with the way that people view gay people globally, people part of the LGBT community and otherwise. I mean, I I had Sony being scared if they could say stuff, and, and for good reason, you know, they were trying to watch out for me, not because, you know, they're prejudiced in any way at all. And I had everyone around me not sure whether they could answer the question to people. But if anyone had asked me, I would have said yes. You know, but no one asked me. No one would even uh, kind of 
get, dab, dabble into the question. So I find it I found it rather fascinating how interested a lot of people have have been by my coming out and and it's actually been really remarkable because I've gotten so much support from um, the gay community, you know, because it's become such a big thing, just like here with Gay SA, you know. I mean, it's been it's been so remarkable seeing the fact that gay people have really mobilized in the modern technological world and with social media and everything. And we're all coming together and really becoming a group of people that are making a difference and making our voices heard. Because, I mean, you're a role model and people look up to you and, and they certainly will look up to you as your story gets more known and you get more known throughout the world. I mean, here in Africa, I mean, certainly in some countries you can sort of be put to death in Tanzania on the news this morning. 30 years jail just for being a gay. Um, they've stopped all HIV treatment for gay people. So, I mean, there's some hectic stuff happening in this continent. And even in our country, even though we have a very liberal constitution, people still go through hectic stuff and mainly religious things. You know, people say the Bible this, the Bible that. We've just had Pastor Anderson banned from this country because he was going to bring that very homophobic messages into the, uh, you know, to, to the populace here. Um, so certain people would look up to you and, and would also resonate with your coming out story to say, well, if it was easy for him, why should it be difficult for me? How, how do you inspire young people then uh, in, in this sort of process? Well, look, I was the first gay person to come out at my high school. So it wasn't always easy um, being being who I wanted to be. I mean, you know, when I first wanted to wear some some bright, you know, collared shirts in high school and wear some pants, you know, and obviously as an artist, I had to have a second coming out, which is quite frustrating. Um, but, you know, I was, I was the first person to come out when I was a kid at my school, and I have to say, it was not easy. You know, I had to be the person that I would make fun of people before they could make fun of me. You know, and I had to be someone that I didn't really think I was for a little while, just to, just to show people that I, I was strong, that I was stronger than they were, and that's the thing is that we have to be stronger than most of the people around us, and so many people will never understand the ways in which we have to build those strengths, and even on a day-to-day -day business way, the way I do business is so much more intense than so many of the people around me, but it's because I have to command the respect from people around me so that they don't, you know, I have to, or else they just won't take what I'm saying seriously and they won't come along, you know, for the ride seriously. So it definitely has changed me, and I think that it's changed me for the good. You know, I think that I am the person I am today because of that, even though when you're young, it's so difficult to see that, isn't it? You just think... Uh, there's no gay people, you know, where are all the gay people? Are there, am I the only gay person? Like, am I the only gay person that exists? I mean, truly, you, you really think that. And it's amazing when you get to be older and you realize that all of those things that you had to learn so young become these massive strengths and become a way that you can command the world around you and shape the destiny that you want to shape. So, do you think there's a danger in being so openly gay in the music industry? Do you, do you think some people won't listen to your music because of that? Or have you found a way no. to sort of cross over and uh, get all audiences uh, happy with what you do? Look, I, I've i gotten audiences happy with, with what I've done, I think, up to this point. It's definitely always something that I have to think about. But at the end of the day, I have to do the same thing that all of the great black singers of the past did, that all the great, you know, singers that have been within any minority group have done when they're going against the majority, and they just have to have the music and the voice and the beauty and the honesty and everything just be heard. And that's all we can do is, is if I just have to amp it up, and maybe I'll have to do it, you know, five times better than my straight counterpart over here, you know? But if I do do it better, at some point, my voice will be the one that will be heard, hopefully, right? Like, for longer, maybe, and then we'll go, you know, into some other depths that maybe I didn't even know I could achieve. So the only thing that I could think is, is it gives me inspiration daily to push my limits um, musically okay. and vocally. Okay, one last personal question before we talk about the music a little bit more. 
And I think all our listeners are dying to find out. Are you single? Or is there a Mr. Beelfield somewhere? <laughs> yes, I'm single. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've, you know, I've, I've been through a few, I guess. Um, <laughs> but yes, I'm single as of right now, um, happily. Um, yeah, so. Okay, I, I can see some people packing their bags for Australia as we speak. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, coming to the music, you were saying um, you had somebody, they say that you had to sort of unlearn all your classical experience to get into the pop field. What is the difference between being a classical singer or, and uh, a pop singer? Well, I suppose the, the biggest difference from a technical as um, standpoint is airflow. Uh, I don't know if that means, that might not mean anything to that many people, but I can show, give you a little example. Yes. Um, <clears throat> for instance, in opera, <clears throat> when we sing, it's very much, um, the airflow is very consistent. So that's why the vibrato becomes consistent, and it's very much like, you know, It's very even, everything's very even, versus in pop, it's like, you know, I don't set another light to it on. Yeah, I gotta, I'm a star boy. You know what I mean? It's very, very breathy um, and, and very airy. And that's also why a lot of um, pop singers have issues uh, with vocal nodules, um, all sorts of different things. Um, but even more than that, you know, when, when you're in the recording studio and you're singing into a microphone that's like this and, and you really want to sing to somebody in their living room, Right, like out of their laptop, let's say, and I want them to be able to hear the vocal that I'm singing and feel like I'm actually right next to them, singing them to sleep. Um, versus in opera, we are trying to communicate with thousands of people across a massive stage, and if anyone was next to you, they would think it was the most awful experience ever. So I'd say that that. Just from a vocal standpoint, it's, it couldn't be more different. Um, and from an intimacy standpoint, you know, it's it's a different it's a different feeling. It, it makes people feel something very different, I'd say. Um, yeah, but then surely as a classically trained uh, singer, you have much more control over your voice, which means your voice will probably last much longer than somebody who comes without training and just bashes it out and, you know, as you say, nodules on the vocal cords and all sorts of damage, and before you know it, no voice left, and that's the end of the career. Well, that's the hope, isn't it? That's the hope. <laughs> well, I, I like to think when I wake up in the morning and my voice isn't feeling very good and I have to do something, I know what to do with it. So I can kind of put it back into, into shape a little bit, whereas a lot of pop singers kind of go into the studio or go into a performance and they're just like, oh, well, it doesn't feel very good today, so I'm going to keep singing on something that doesn't feel good because they never really had the opportunity to take that time. So in a way, I'm, I feel very lucky to have had like a decade of just being able to train, you know, um, like something that most people never have the opportunity for. Does this mean, though, that this is the end of the classical career? Are you only going to do pop, or is there still sort of a happy medium somewhere in between? Look, it's just whoever asks me, you know, to do things. You know, like, I don't know if I'm going to come to South Africa, but if a presenter... You know, sends me an you know sends me an Instagram message or sends my manager something. I'll come to South Africa and do a performance. You know, and it's the same in, in opera. I mean, <coughs> I did two operas in May and June, and um, one in uh, Philadelphia and one in Montreal, and uh, they went really well. And if people ask me back, and I have the time, and it's and it's there, you know, I'd love to do it, and I'll go and do it. So it's really just more about opportunity and what, you know, where everything is kind of pushing me, what direction. Well, I'll certainly speak to your manager because I think there's a great opportunity perhaps next year for you to come and do like a, a variety of things, maybe do some prides, do some poppy things, and maybe do some serious things with some of our symphony orchestras. Hey, that would be amazing, yeah. That would be killer. I'd love that. Uh, so, so the Chishak, I've, I've, I've never been, to, I've never been either. Oh, you're going to love never it. Been your oh, you're going to be so popular, yeah, <laughs> dear. <laughs> so, uh, the EP, tell us about the EP. How did that come about? You wrote all the songs yourself. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I wrote all the songs myself. Uh, Boom and Bust is the name of the EP. 
I I didn't know uh, I didn't know if it would go well. To be quite honest, I I had written the songs and I had I had written some music before, but nothing on on that scope. And I wrote all the lyrics. I wrote all the the music. So it was a very um, it was very terrifying sort of experience of releasing it because. I didn't have anyone to really share in the blame, so to speak, <laughs> if people didn't like it. So I was kind of just jumping off of cliffs, um, sort of. But, you know, it's been really rewarding, and people have really liked it. And, and it's kind of amazing that now that I get a chance, now other um, producers want to work with me, which really is what this business is all about. Music is all about collaboration, you know, and if people aren't collaborating with you, um, you're not going to experience new things and be able to do something new. And the fact is, is, is when I first started it, I had a lot of um, a lot of pushback actually, because people said, "Oh well, you know, he's an opera singer. How can he sing pop? You know, what what does he want to do? Like, how is he blah blah blah?" And so that's kind of why I ended up writing a lot of this myself. Was just because I was like, "Well." I guess I'll just do it myself if nobody, you know, if, if some of these people don't. And now I have people coming to me wanting to, you know, produce tracks and, and then talking about the sound that is the Bealfield sound and, and this whole thing. And, and that's very gratifying, you know, the fact that I created this sound for myself and created, you know, a, a world for my music to fit in is, is pretty cool. So I've been very psyched about it. So was you hard at work on the uh, on the uh, full album thing? Yeah, well, so um, I really want to explore some other sides to my voice. Um, in in the popular world, obviously, um, I really want to give some more um, sounds, some more sounds of intimacy um, to people, um, and and some more more emotion, more feelings, more um, heartache. You know, really, really explore some different areas and see kind of where that takes me. But in the meantime, I'm doing a big collaboration. Um, hopefully, it's kind of all really very under wraps, so I can't really talk about it. But I'm sure when it comes out, I'm sure you'll know the person that I'm um, uh, going to be collaborating with. And um, I'm hoping that that will be the next release. Uh, but I'm not sure, so I can't really say anything because it's not set in stone yet. Um, but definitely I have a couple of tracks that I'm looking at for um, a bigger, a larger body of work. And, uh, and they, just, they just say a lot. You know, it's more just about intimacy um, than anything. And, you know, and we'll throw in a little bit of fun. And the, the live performance aspect, that must be fun to do that. Oh, yeah, the live aspect has been really awesome. I mean, especially going from me singing it like, the opera house to now be like performing at nightclubs and stuff at like one in the morning. It's, it's really, sometimes I just, I'm just on the stage and I'm like, really? Like this is what I'm doing right now. I can't even believe it myself sometimes. So it's been, it's been just this remarkable journey and, uh, and, and the support is really awesome, you know, to be able to just go into a club and, and sing the heck out of some song, you know, even if I'm, if I open with some cover, you know, like I think I opened for GRL, uh, I guess a couple weeks ago here, um, and um, I opened with a, just a little bit of like Last Dance, just the opening of it, and then I went into a couple of my tracks, and everyone was just like screaming and, you know, loving it and everything, so it's really exciting, because um, I haven't even begun to explore uh, where the limits of my live performance are. Um, so it seems like you've got a great career ahead of you. Um, have people started throwing underwear at the stage yet? <laughs> well, I'm just happy that they're pronouncing my name right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, you know, the, the phones are out, you know, the whole deal. Um, you know, the, the, the pictures and, and people sending me messages just being like, look, you just blew me out of the water, you know, I'm so blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's just so gratifying. So what else could you want? Fantastic. Could I ask you to give us one one bit of uh, message to somebody out there, maybe in South Africa, somewhere in a rural area, perhaps, who wants to sing and doesn't know where to start? Just give them a bit of advice uh, to end off. 
Well, I'd say that um, that singing regularly is probably the best thing that you can do. Um, you know, of course, it, it always depends on, on, you know, what age you are. So about the time that you're, you know, during a voice change, for instance, I would say be really careful. You know, you can sing in, in some, you know, some choirs or with, you know, some friends and stuff like that. Very simple sort of singing. And then, you know, when, when your voice actually, you know, has solidly changed, I guess it's most important that you're, that you're singing and that you're singing regularly. You know, every day, no matter what that is, depending on whatever ritual, you know, you have in your going on in your life, that's the most important thing because you're really, you know, you're strengthening um, your your core and you're making sure that everything's even. And the more and more you do it, your body really knows a good portion of what to do naturally if you just kind of pay attention. So it's more just about doing it and doing it, you know, every day, just a little bit. I'm not talking about it, but actually doing it. Exactly, exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bealfield here, all the way from Australia on Gay SO Radio, where you are family. And this is uh, Bealfield with Frequency. Amazing song. What a dance tune. I play that every morning just to get up. <laughs>